There are some other problems with government developing drugs that I don't think people have thought through more fully, which is really the long-term commitment. And whether government's really willing to make a long-term commitment to provide that drug forever, uh, I think we're seeing the danger of that strategy uh, with changing political parties, with changing political fashions. So we think nonprofits should be considered we think for-profit companies need to be held responsible for what they're developing. Uh, and the government has tremendous leverage to um, really shape how those companies perform and what their incentives are. I'm Fred Ledley. I'm a professor of natural and applied science and also management at Bentley University. I have a, I'm a physician by training and have done medical research, startup biotech companies and now do research at Bentley, really looking how to um, bridge that interface, that, that sometimes troubled interface between science and business. So the modern synthesis of science in the United States really dates back to World War II. And the aftermath of World War II, um, the Endless Frontier was a report written by Vannevar Bush, president of MIT, who recognized the real power of basic science emerging in the world and that investments in basic science are going to really bear tremendous fruit for the public, for society, and for the economy. And while most people think of that report as being related to the ability to develop an atomic bomb and end the war, a lot of that report actually had to do with the discovery of penicillin and development of that drug, because that had been developed decades before, it had been invented decades before, but it had never been developed. It was very hard to develop. And in fact, no one had ever been treated. And the government realized the importance of penicillin to the war effort. And in an episode that reads a lot like what we just experienced with COVID, they reached out to academics, they reached out to industry, and ultimately supported Pfizer, among others, and Lilly, to develop commercial methods to make enormous amounts of penicillin, which had saved hundreds of thousands of lives during the war. And that became a model to let the basic science thrive, to be sure it had enough support from the National Science Foundation, which was invigorated uh, after that report, and by the NIH, which became a much more significant entity after the war. And the NIH spends about half of its budget on basic science. This is stuff that can be pretty obscure. I, I teach my class about how studies on earthworms and how earthworms develop and how, how absurd to study earthworm intestines. But most of what we know about cancer and how we can enable cancer cells to die, and about half of the drugs coming to market now for cancer therapy come from those studies. And those were undertaken by scientists with government support. That was that data, that knowledge, that know-how, that training of young people is then available in the public domain for companies. So there are things that companies are really very good at. at Large-scale development, for example, the reason government turned to Pfizer to make penicillin is they could grow hundreds of thousands of liters of media. Academics don't do that. Government doesn't have that capacity. Um, but the whole synthesis that Vannevar Bush came up with is that, that that knowledge would be transferred to industry to do what they're good at, which is development, it is commercialization, which is very different than basic science. That's been the synthesis for the last half century, and it's been wildly successful. Everyone has their favorite anecdotes of some study in worms or fruit flies or fungus that led to new drugs. We undertook a study some years ago to do this systematically, to ask how many of the drugs that came to market really had basic science supported by the NIH. And the results were essentially all of them. Of the 387 drugs we looked at, 99.6% of them, we could identify NIH-funded basic science, which was essential for approval of that drug. And we know the basic science is necessary. So that this is an investment that really bears fruit. It bears fruit in terms of the people who benefit from those drugs. It bears fruit in terms of the jobs that are created by commercializing that.
And ultimately, not our research, but others have shown that for every dollar the government invests in that research, private enterprise invests about two or three dollars. So it's, it's a classic multiplier where that public investment does a tremendous amount of good. So there's been a lot of controversy over the last couple of years over whether the fact that you reduce drug prices through the Inflation Reduction Act or a number of other measures have been introduced to lower drug prices, whether that would have a negative impact on innovation. Um, we don't think so, actually. We think this is a pretty robust system and that um, the system may change a bit if drug prices come down too much. But we don't think that drug prices are the prime driver of innovation. Um, if you look at market forces, yes, the larger the market, the more companies invest in drugs. Uh, if you introduce a new demographic um, and give them access to drugs they didn't have before, like Medicare Part D does, there's evidence that that market will increase and industry will try to capture those markets by making investments. But we don't see any direct relationship between drug prices and investments in innovation when we look back at, at uh, market data over the last several decades. And for many reasons, we think that's a false assumption, that many of the dollars for the very early investment, those, those early investments which are taking the risk, doing that discovery, we call it originating the drug in the early trials, that money is actually coming from capital markets, not from revenues. So that that innovation capital, the first capital comes from government. That's that early enabling investment coming from the NIH, some from philanthropies, some from universities. But that next tranche of investment is largely coming from capital markets. And um, those markets aren't driven by the price of a drug that hasn't even been discovered yet. We all do the calculation. We all calculate how much do we have to invest, what's our return on investment going to be. But more often, that investment is returned by the company they're investing in being acquired, which is much faster, it's a much quicker return, and it is a much less risky return for those investors. So there's a whole different dynamic driving investments in early stage drug discovery than in the late stages. The late stages is funded by revenues. Companies, large companies spend a lot on R&D. Uh, no reason to, dis to dismiss how much they're spending. They're spending sort of 18 to 20 percent of their revenues are on R&D. But that's mostly for late stage development, which is very expensive for getting that product over the line to satisfy regulatory requirements. <clears throat> Once it's on the market, they're obligated to test for pediatric markets or or, or smaller niche markets involving at-risk populations. Um, they also spend a lot of money just trying to build their market size. If you have one indication, why not go for two? Why not go for three? If it's a drug given by intravenous injection, why not make it a subcutaneous injection? These matter to, for the market. They matter for the companies and investors. That's not the type of innovation that we really talk about when we talk about what the public requires, which is treatments for drugs, or drugs for diseases that don't exist yet, and drugs for conditions that are just inadequately treated. That's not primarily coming from revenues. Our group is very interested in what we call diseases of poverty. And that includes neglected tropical diseases. There are many different terms people use. But for us, the common denominator is poverty. While we think of these diseases as affecting South Saharan Africa or Southeast Asia, they do occur in pockets in the United States and Europe where you have poverty. The problem here is a classic market failure. If we're talking about diseases of poverty, it's not going to be a lucrative investment. You're, you're developing drugs for diseases that are severe that have huge mortalities, that create great morbidity, that have enormous social impact in preventing those communities from thriving. We, talk, we call this the burden of disease. It's not just death, it's not just death rate, it's also the disability. How many years of healthy, productive life are lost due to diseases? And this is not necessarily a market uh, large companies or even early stage investors are gonna be interested in.
And in fact, there's a lot of data that industry does not serve these markets. Very few of the drugs coming to market in the last decade have been for these, these types of diseases. One of the ones we've been most interested in is tuberculosis, and particularly multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. And for 40, 50 years, there were no new drugs developed for this disease. We still treat tuberculosis with drugs we had in the 50s and 60s, and that are still very good, but increasingly they're resistant strains, so they're harder and harder to treat. And it's really taken different avenues to get these drugs funded. One is the Gates Foundation and other foundations have made efforts to do this, and, and they've worked with industry, they've worked with universities to promote several drugs. We think one of the most interesting uh, observations is that one of these drugs was developed by a nonprofit. It's a group called the Tuberculosis Alliance, the TB Alliance, uh, is a pure nonprofit which has really functioned like a high-end biotech company in developing a very effective drug called protominid, entirely with, with money from governments and philanthropies. And one of the questions we asked is, is this actually an effective model? Because this is, this is a company that's not gonna get any revenues from the drugs they develop. If the drugs sold in the United States or Europe, they'll get revenues, but that's not where the disease occurs. The disease occurs in Egypt, in Bangladesh, in South Saharan Africa. Um, and in those countries, they don't even get a royalty. And the challenge here is it really turns economic science head a little bit, and that is there, there's no sustainable source of revenues. So if they want to develop now another drug, and they have a pipeline of really interesting products, we think very highly of this, this company, this group. It's, it is a company, it's a nonprofit company. They have to go back to philanthropy. They have to go back to governments to fund the next development and the next one. They're really good. They've pulled it off so far. As government now, as we're seeing in the United States, a lot of that money came, or a significant amount came from USAID. That money may not exist anymore. If governments back off on some of the funding for these things, that's gonna stretch for private philanthropy at also. So it, it remains seen to be seen how viable this model really is. We've studied the model, we've studied what they've done. It really is state-of-the-art drug development. Uh, we've also studied the back end of this, which is once they get the drug developed, does a nonprofit have an inside track to get it to people? Are they more trusted? Are they more closely affiliated with the nonprofits on the ground who actually have the patients, who are actually putting it in their hands, who are providing, who are acquiring the funding required to actually buy the drug and, and ship it to the, to the site where people have these diseases. And that, that remains a challenge. These organizations have historically been very wary of, of private enterprise. There's a long history of real serious antipathy between private enterprise and public health. And it does look like the TB Alliance has made some inroads there and that they may be able to build a much more efficient track between that development process, which is very classic. They're contracting for it, they're outsourcing it, they're acting just like a private company, but without private capital. Um, but they may also have an advantage on the back end and be able to take care of people in, in a more efficient manner. So we're really interested in studying this nonprofit model in more detail. It's, there's very little guidance to go on here. You know, if, uh, Lester Solomon was a great scholar of the nonprofit business model, Johns Hopkins over the years, and unfortunately passed during the pandemic. But he pointed out that nonprofits aren't synonymous with charities. Many nonprofits, in fact, have viable business models. And that, in fact, in his studies, his, his tremendous broad studies across the world, what differentiates a nonprofit is simply they don't distribute their revenues or their profits to shareholders. So there is a cost savings, right? It does keep money in the ecosystem of health, in the ecosystem of developing drugs for the next disease and the next disease. Um, but that's not enough. That's not enough to overcome the sort of problems we have
attracting investment for diseases of poverty, for emerging diseases. Um, it, it may take something else. What we find is the incentives aren't necessarily structured correctly. So a tax break doesn't help a nonprofit company. And yet many of the incentives from the U.S. government from, through the FDA involve tax breaks, tax credits, R&D tax credits. And you may need different mechanisms to now put that proper um, incentive in the hands of nonprofit organizations. TB Alliance did take advantage of an incentive called a priority review voucher. And that is because diseases um, of neglected tropical diseases is the language, because those developing a drug for those diseases grants you a priority review voucher that you can now sell to another company so they can get a faster review time. This was intended to be cash to a system that needed it, and it worked. Now, unfortunately, the price of those vouchers is not as high as many people might have anticipated. So we, we have an incentive system structured to incentivize for-profit companies, which is definitely necessary. Um, I don't think we, as a society, we fully thought out the incentive structures to enable nonprofits to do their part as well. Um, it is, this isn't free, right? It, this does require continued government investment. It requires um, evidence-based policies. Um, those policies have to be very carefully crafted. And we think they should take into account nonprofit enterprise as well as the private sector. We don't see a huge role for government in developing these drugs. I know that's a sentiment that uh, people champion, Bernie Sanders has championed. Um, it, there, there are some other problems with government developing drugs that I don't think people have thought through more fully, which is really the long-term commitment. And whether government's really willing to make a long-term commitment to provide that drug forever, uh, I think we're seeing the danger of that strategy uh, with changing political parties, with changing political fashions. So we think nonprofits should be considered. We think for-profit companies need to be held responsible for what they're developing. Uh, and the government has tremendous leverage to um, really shape how those companies perform and what their incentives are. It, AI is gonna change a lot of things here. And um, one of them will certainly be drug development and drug discovery, particularly. Um, for health, we think it's only a boon. That the faster you can develop drugs, um, from a science side, we have to do something about this failure rate. 90% of the best ideas the scientists have still fail when they're actually put into human subjects. And you ask, do they work? Are they safe? Are they solving our problem? So anything we could do to accelerate that, to make it more efficient, and we think AI will prove to be another tool. Whether it's truly a revolutionary tool remains to be seen, but it's absolutely where people are thinking these days. In my work, it enables me to read in areas where I have no fundamental expertise, understanding it's no more perfect than my students or my own reading of a literature in law or in history where, where I'm not a scholar. So it, it really is, and, and I really grew up believing that this type of thing has tremendous power to extend our human capabilities. Um, you know, I don't tend to get off on the science fiction part of it taking over the world, but I think it makes humans better.